introduce to you uh, Bernd Muller, who is the JB uh, Duke Professor of Physics at Duke University, who is here at Yale on sabbatical for the rest of the, the semester and then the summer. And uh, he, his office is over in the right lab near where John's office and my office is. For those of you, we encourage you to come over and chat with him if you haven't already. Or even if you haven't already, come over and chat again with Bert. He is around. Um, as I said, he's, he's uh, an, at Duke University and he's a professor of physics in the nuclear theory, working a lot on the understanding the quark gluon plasma that's made, which is what we do uh, as an experimentalist, John and I, both the experiments at RIC and at the Large Hadron Collider. Bert was one of the people responsible for the theoretical foundation that triggered why RIC was there and later why um, the LHC should be built and have a heavy iron program at it, not just the Higgs search for it. Um, since 2013 until 2020, he was also very importantly to me, the Associate Lab Director of um, Nuclear and Particle Physics at Brookhaven National Laboratory. He's now returned back to Duke as a full professor. But whilst there, he was responsible for the RIC program that went on to help me keep the STAR program going and was also one of the key players in getting the electron ion collider approved and also now approved for construction at Brookhaven National Lab. And that will be hopefully coming online in about 2035. So we look forward to that. But what he's going to talk to us today about is thermal physics of empty space, heating the vacuum with heavy ions. And with that, I hand it over to Bert to tell us more. Thank you very much. Okay. So Helen, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Actually, yes. I should switch this on, I realize. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay, good. So um, thank you very much for the invitation to give a physics club lecture here. Um, it's the first in person lecture I've given for over two years. So I hope it's not too rusty. Um, and um, so let me proceed. So I'll begin with um, a brief introduction talking about why we actually are interested in the topic of thermalization of empty space uh, when we think about heavy ion collisions. So here is a cartoon um, that shows how we conceptualize a collision of two, between two nuclei at very high energy. I'm sure you've seen similar cartoons from talks by some of the experimentalists here, two nuclei approaching at high speed, close to the speed of light, highly Lorentz contracted. The nucleons basically pass through each other, but they deposit energy in the space that begins to extend between them. And so this is the position of energy into what was previously empty space, and that energy turns out to be thermalizing extraordinarily rapidly. Um, the temperature scale we're talking about here is in the trillions of Kelvin. And I'll say a bit more about this for in case you're not familiar with these units that we're gonna be using. And the main questions are is, um, how long does it take to actually thermalize when you put energy into uh, empty space? To what extent is it really thermal? And how does the thermalization process work? So let me, for those of you who are not dealing with heavy ion collisions every day, I give you a brief introduction about the units and, and, and the dimensions and scales that we'll be talking about. So um, I'll be using a temperature scale of million electron volts. I'll drop the Boltzmann constant whenever it appears, so I use temperature for an energy or an energy for a temperature scale. Um, just for a um, impression, the typical scale of 1 million electron volts of 1 MeV corresponds to about 20 billion Kelvin and 100 MeV, which is really the scale we'll be talking about, corresponds to um, 1 trillion Kelvin. Uh, in comparison, the core of the sun has a temperature of about one kilo electron volt. That's thousands of an MeV. So we're talking really about gigantic temperatures that previously, before we did these experiments, only existed or briefly existed for microseconds in the early universe. The highest temperature that has been experimentally demonstrated up to this point is in the range of about 300 million electron volts. 
And we know that the matter that was emitting it initially started at the temperature that's for simulations of about 500 million electron volts. So we talked about temperature scales. What about lengths and time scales? Because they're also important. The typical length scale that's useful here is one femtometer or often called one Fermi. That's 10 to minus 50 meter. And that's roughly the radius of a proton or a neutron. Nuclei, of course, are collections of, of, of protons and neutrons. And the typical heavy nucleus that's used at RIC or at the LHC, gold or lead, has a radius of seven femtometers. The time scale that's of relevance here, because we're at high energy, so almost all processes proceed at the speed of light, is one femtometer over the speed of light. And that corresponds to about three times 10 to the minus 24 seconds. And one also has conversion units of H, H bar or H bar times the speed of light, which are indicated here that uh, show how you can convert length scales into energy scales and or momentum scales uh, uh, and, and time scales into energy scales. Calculations that discretize quantum chromodynamics um, the theory of quartz and nuance on a discrete space-time lattice, Euclidean space-time lattice, we now know pretty well with high precision what the equation of state of empty space at very high temperatures is. And so we can uh, calculate the energy density of the pressure of the entropy density as a function of temperature. And this shows the results that are now textbook results, uh, typically plotted as the scale, the, the quantity divided by the temperature of the fourth power to make it dimensionless. And uh, what we do now is that over the whole temperature range that interest, that's of interest here, that's up to several hundred million electron volts, uh, the core gluon gas that you produce is not an ideal gas. It has interactions, strong interactions. And so it doesn't quite sa saturate the Stefan Boltzmann limit, but has a reduction of 30 or more percent in terms of uh, say the energy density. So I'll go now through a few slides in which I show you what the experimental evidence is. What the lattice can tell us is if the matter is thermalized, if empty space with vacuum quantum numbers is thermalized, what is the equation of state? It cannot tell you whether actually it, it has been thermalized, whether actually thermal equilibrium has been reached. For that, you need experiments. And I will go through some of the experimental evidence. And what I'll cover is spectra of particles and show you how well they are thermal. They're actually coming from a collectively moving source that radiates the particles. I'll talk about particle yields. You can look at the chemical distribution of particles and you find that actually they are very nicely described by your thermal model. Um, we'll briefly look at flow patterns that show that the matter actually is described by hydrodynamics very close to thermal equilibrium. And finally, it's not just single particle observables. There are n particle correlations with n up to six or eight that have been studied that all show and agree with that thermal picture. So let's begin with the spectrum. So here it shows, this is a data taken by the STAR experiment uh, at Brookhaven and at different energies. And they have been fitted with a spectra of particles expected from a moving source, an outwardly expanding source that expands under its own internal pressure of a given temperature. And you see that this fits over a wide energy range, very different particles from pions to uh, protons and other particles extremely well. When you ask, what about the relative composition of different particles? You don't care about the spectrum, but just the total yields, then uh, these yields should be described by the exponential of uh, just by but just the Gibbs factor, e to the minus uh, the uh, total mass uh, or rest energy divided by the temperature. And what you find is that for a very large number of variety of particles, they fit with the same temperature perfectly well within the experimental limits. So. The particles are really emitted from all we know from a common thermal source. 
And we can look further into the question of is that to what extent does that thermal source behave as a fluid? In other words, is there a common flow velocity, um, a fl common flow pattern that describes collective physics? Uh, one can do that by just looking at the spectra, of course, but one can also look at the angular distribution that is dependent on the particular flow pattern. And what I show here is different angular components, Fourier components of the I pattern in, in, in uh, azimuthal angle around the beam axis is very nicely described by a particular initial state given uh, viscous relativistic hydrodynamics. And you can push this to the point of multi-particle correlations. Here it goes up to eighth or ninth order of n particle correlations. That really tells you something about how initial density fluctuations, and the plot here is a cut through perpendicular to the beam axis through the density, energy density distribution that is deposited by the colliding nuclei. And these energy density fluctuations basically within the hydrodynamic expansion behave like individual sound sources. So you can look at this as uh, the propagation of sound by individual random sources deposited um, in that transverse plane. And then viscous hydrodynamics tells you that the different uh, higher order moments of that sound should fall off with the order that you look at. And indeed, that's exactly what you find. So this is very strong evidence that not only single particle, but also multi-particle correlations are those that would be, that are emitted by a thermal source. So this is remarkable result for a system that does not contain an infinite number of particles or Avogadro's numbers of particles, but just in this case, uh, a few thousand particles and which lives very briefly. So I've shown you the evidence of thermalization. In fact, there are hundreds of different analyses that have been done by people trying to find deviations, significant deviations, and they've all failed. So as far as we know, this is as well described in terms of thermal physics as anything one might possibly expect. In, a, in fact, one finds that it is in some sense too good to be true. And let me tell you an example of what I mean here. So this is another plot now by the Alice experiment at CERN at even higher energies that looks at an even larger number of different particles. And uh, in particular, one particle they look at, and I think Star does the same, is called the hypertriton. That's a particle that's composed of a proton, a neutron, and a lambda hyperon. And that particle is extremely weakly bound. Its binding energy is 0.4 MeV. But it is described by the emission from a thermal source with a temperature of 150 MeV. And it is also a particle that is known to be big. Its radius is more than 10 femtometers. So in some sense, the particle doesn't I mean, either it's extremely weakly bound, why should it exist in an environment of a temperature that is almost a thousand times larger than its binding energy? And secondly, how does it fit into a fireball that is fairly of the size of that quantum state? So this is somewhat puzzling, and it begs the question, how does one actually make sense of this? So what that suggests that maybe in a bit more than what we usually think about thermal physics, there's some general principle at work. And um, that's what I really want to focus on in the rest of my talk. There is actually another example in fundamental physics where we know that thermal physics plays an unexpected role and an unexpectedly almost perfect role and that is the formation of black holes. As Hawking has told us almost 50 years ago, is that when you collapse matter into a black hole, then there is thermal particle emission from the event horizon. And not only that, one can actually associate a macroscopic entropy with 
a black hole. But when you think about a black hole, it's really basically empty space filled by gravitational fields. So in a sense, it's not that different from the fireball created in a very high energy heavy ion collision, which is also has vacuum quantum numbers. So it is very hot, quote unquote, empty space that radiates at a very high temperature. And so the question arises, is, uh, is there a connection? Now, if we had, like in the case of heavy ion collisions, where we have an underlying quantum field theory, quantum chromodynamics, that the principle allows to describe the collision process in quantum mechanical detail. If the, we had a reliable quantum theory of gravity, some people believe that, but we don't really know that we do, we don't have any experiment evidence, then the formation of a black hole would be like a collision process, um, which would be governed by the scattering matrix. And as we know in quantum mechanics, scattering matrices are unitary. And so really information is not lost in the process. It may be hidden because the final state is very complex, but it's not lost. And so in the case of black holes, this was called the information paradox that one really didn't understand how a black hole would actually decay by thermal emission, but in the end, no fundamental entropy, no fundamental information should be lost. So we'll talk about that also towards the end of this uh, talk. But we'll use this concept uh, in the meantime, that the entropy that is created by the radiation of particles from a black hole is real entanglement entropy. Entanglement entropy between the many different quanta that I emitted and I want to make a case that the same is true in the case of a heavy ion collision. So, um, the remarkable thing over the past decade, and that's what we want to do next, is that not only is this uh, something that has nice words that go with it, but actually there are mathematical formulations that allow us to make direct contact between the phenomenon of black hole evaporation and the process of heating and particle emission in heavy ion collisions. The basis for this is a concept called holography, or also in a more specific way, uh, antithesitor space conformal field theory duality. In order to thermalize energy, you need strong interactions. It cannot happen in a weakly coupled system in a short period of time. But if there are strong interactions, that's fundamentally possible. And so you need, if you want to describe this, a theory that allows to describe quantum mechanically in a precise way, a system that's governed by strong interaction. And for decades, we didn't have such a theory, um, but we do since the late nineties, uh, when Mandasena proposed that actually a certain uh, supersymmetric gauge theory called uh, N equal four, large number of color uh, Young-Mills theory, um, super Young-Mills theory is uh, equivalent to a particular string theory that in the limit of a large coupling strength in the gauge theory can be described by classical gravity. So this is related to QCD in the sense that it is a non abelian gauge theory. It has in addition to QCD, supersymmetry, which makes it mathematically more elegant in some sense and allows um, more conclusions that we can do in real QCD. But it also has a particular feature, namely that it has conformal inv invariance. In the gravity side, that's reflected by the fact that the gravity lives in a conformally invariant five-dimensional space of uh, space-time. Uh, which is called antithesitor space, which is really a vacuum solution of Einstein's equations with a negative cosmological constant. So in some sense, a maximally symmetric space time in which one can do many calculations exactly uh, that allow to study the physics of strongly coupled gauge theories 
in a precise way. So the, there's a dictionary that's been developed that allows to map what's going on in the gauge theory to calculations that one can do in the five-dimensional gravity theory in anti-decitter space. And I've listed those here. Um, so uh, for example, um, strong coupling in the gauge theory corresponds to weak coupling in the gravity theory, which means that we can make a classical approximation to the full string theory. The vacuum in the gauge theory corresponds to the empty antithesis space. If there is a black hole in the fifth dimension, so in other words, if one has a black hole in the antithesis space, then it corresponds to thermal physics in the gauge theory. And so in this mapping, the process of thermalization in a strongly coupled gauge theory, that is a cousin of QCD, can be precisely mapped into the formation of black holes in the gravity theory. And this, whereas the thermalization is a quantum phenomenon and it requires complete solution of quantum field theory, which we can't do in real time, Solving black hole formation classically in a five dimension space time is something we have the mathematical tools, namely differential equations of Einstein's equations in five dimension. So, what's been the, the idea then is to study thermalization in the gauge theory by, by studying the formation of black holes in the gravity theory in the five dimension. A, condition of two heavy ions which injects energy into the space between the two heavy ions through the collision process then corresponds to the injection of energy into the five dimension gravity theory and observing how it forms a black hole. So the idea here is that we have the quantum field theory, the gauge theory living on a boundary at infinity in that five dimensional space. We have the addition fifth coordinate of the anti decitter space going into what one usually calls the bulk of the five dimensions. And by injecting mass or energy into that five dimensional space near the boundary and let it fall down and fall and, and form a black hole, one can map this into the thermalization process in the boundary gauge theory. So why does this, can this have anything to do with heavy, heavy ions? Let's think about this in a caricature picture in the following way. So the heavy ion collisions happens in four space time dimensions. So in that boundary at infinity in that at this inner space. And imagine here the two nuclei colliding and as they collide, they exchange color between they exchange quanta gluons between the two colliding nuclei, and you build up a gluon field between the two nuclei. And as time proceeds, what happens is that now in the five dimensional description, this is an energy density that you have injected. And of course, under its own gravity, it falls down into the fifth dimension as the nuclei recede. And it falls further and eventually it will fall so far down that the energy density generates the horizon, the event horizon of a black hole. And that's when the thermalization process has happened. In a simplified scenario where one injects energy there and it observes how that energy shell that you put into the five dimension space evolves in the differential equations of five dimension gravity, you can really follow in detail that thermalization process. So um, that's not sufficient because we want to study how thermalization happens. And so what you need to do is you also need probes that tell you how does it thermalize? When does it thermalize? What is the process? And there are multiple probes that you can have. You can have single particle probes that would simply probe the energy density at a given point. You can have two particle probes 
um, probes that look at two different points and ask whether the correlation function of these two points in the gauge theory is actually thermalized. You can do it in more and more complex observables. And one particular important one is called the entropy. Because if you really want to measure how thermal is a quantum mechanical system, you have to calculate its entropy and see whether it has approached that of thermal equilibrium. It turns out that in that anti de Sitter space description, entropy can be described in a geometric way. This was proposed in 2006 by Ryo and Takayanagi. And they showed that you could obtain, you could measure the entropy contained in a finite volume of space that's shown here in yellow by looking for the extremal surface that goes into the bulk, into the fifth dimension of the eight and it is hitter space, which has minimal size, minimal area. And that then directly measures what the entropy contained in that volume is. And there's a formula that connects directly the area of that surface with the gravitational constant in five dimensions with the entropy. Now, if you have produced a black hole in the anti space, it turns out that the minimal area surface falls down and then hugs the event horizon. That gives you the least area. And so that tells you now that you have thermalized because basically what it measures is the area of the event horizon of the black hole. And that can directly by the Bekenstein formula that we have known for decades tells you that the entropy on the surface is related to the entropy associated with the black hole in the anti space. But the process takes time. As this mesh shell falls down and thermalization happens, you can really follow how entropy is created. So we did such a calculation as a diff size of that area, different radii, and asked how long does it take for thermalization to happen? Well, you have to calculate how the entropy evolves as a function of time. We also looked at other observables, but the entropy is, in a sense, the most complete measurement of thermalization. And you find that thermalization proceeds essentially at the speed of light. Now, the fact that it is really here, in this case, the speed of light has to do with this, that the theory that we're studying is conformal. It doesn't have a different scale. In QCD, what you, would, you would expect, if you really could do QCD calculations in this way, you would expect that it would not be precisely the speed of light. There would be some other speed that would come in because QCD has a natural scale. Scale invariance is broken. But nonetheless, um, it gives you an indication on which time scale thermalization can happen. And in particular here, uh, if one says one can apply these concepts at high temperature, far above the natural QCD scale, where maybe scale invariance is a good approximation, it says that the time in which you expect thermalization in a heavy ion collision is of the order of about a third of a femtometer over C, which is roughly 10 to minus 24 seconds. Now, a heavy ion collision, of course, is much more complex than what I showed you in this very schematic calculation. And so over the past decade, people who have followed up on this have done increasingly detailed simulations of energy injection into the five dimensional space that more and more closely resemble nuclear collisions. The way you do that is that you um, generate shock waves of energy corresponding to two nuclei that really are Lorentz contracted walls of energy that approach and collide. And you can do this um, with finite sizes, different impact parameter, with um, different sizes of the shock wave on both sides, if you have asymmetric nuclear collisions. So there has been a lot of studies that all have given some insight into what's happening. And very generally what one has found is that what I told you now in the very schematic, simplest calculation holds true in much more realistic 
scenarios. It helps you that thermalization in a strongly coupled gauge theory like QCD happens on a time scale that is very short compared to the overall time scale of the size of the system that you produce in the heavy ion collision. So this is very important insight. It's important because it is a rigorous calculation. It's not exactly QCD, but it is rigorous. There's no question about approximations and assumptions, except it's not exactly realistic. Now, it's useful to look at this from other points of view and um, where you can actually study QCD. And so what I want to talk about next is an approach that involves what one calls in, um, in, in statistical physics, dynamical chaos. So if you have a system, a dynamical system that's nonlinear with strong interactions, um, then um, you can define entropy of that such a system in a coarse-grained way uh, by averaging over the precise details of measurements. And, and, and the way that one usually does this in classical physics is one says one looks at that dynamical nonlinear system, you prepare it in two initial conditions that are very close to each other, and then you observe how the trajectories of that system drift apart. And if the system is chaotic, they drift apart at an exponential rate. And the exponential rate is governed by what's called a Lyapunov exponent, uh, so that the distance between these two trajectories goes like the initial distance times e to the lambda times t, where lambda is the Lyapunov exponent. If you have a system of many degrees of freedom, then you can have many different Lyapunov exponents corresponding to different degrees of freedom of the system. And the entropy growth rate of the system after you average over fine details, if you coarse grain it, is given by the sum over all the positive Lyapunov exponent. And this is called the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy. It's really an entropy growth rate. So if you can calculate what this rate is, you can calculate how quickly entropy grows and eventually approaches the thermal limit. So in a general case, what you expect is that if you have a nonlinear dynamical system, you prepare it in some initial state, then initially you will find some fluctuations um, of its coarse grain entropy that depend on fine details of the preparation. But then eventually it will grow in a linear rate, at a linear rate given by this kolmogorov sinai entropy. And eventually as it approaches the certain limit, it will tail off and approach thermalization. This is the domain that you usually describe by relaxation to equilibrium. And the linear growth rate in between is dynamics far away from equilibrium. So in the case of QCD, you can actually study it by saying for a moment, let's take the gauge theory, color SU3 gauge theory, as a classical system and study it on a lattice look at the dynamics and see, is it a chaotic system? What are the Lapunov exponents? What one finds is one does that, writes down the equation for the non-abelian gauge theory with interactions. You solve them on a three-dimensional lattice as a function of time. You find that all degrees of freedom, except those that have conservation laws with them, are exponentially unstable and have a positive Lapunov exponent. That means that the entropy is extensive. The more degrees of freedom you have in the volume, the more the bigger the entropy is, and actually it is proportion to the volume. So you have a finite kolmogorov sinai entropy density, which gives you a finite growth rate, which depends on the energy density in which you have prepared the system. More energy density you've put in initially, the faster the approach to equilibrium. So this has been studied and we can actually calculate this. 
This is, of course, a classical gauge theory. And you can ask the question, what about quantum mechanics? We'll come to that in a moment. So independent of this, in the context of the thermalization that is associated with the collapse to a black hole, um, Matasena, Schenker, and uh, Stanford proposed a number of years ago that there was an upper limit to what in a dynamical theory, a Dapunov exponent would be. And it was a limit, which they said it cannot be larger, and it gave a mathematical proof that it can be larger than two pi times the temperature that is the ultimate thermal limit that the system approaches. So if this is the ultimate limit, and there is now good evidence, numerical evidence, that in the case of black hole physics, that limit is saturated. So black holes are thought to be the most chaotically dynamic systems that scramble information uh, that are conceivable. How chaotic is QCD? How chaotic is the gauge theory? The calculations that I showed you show that it's not quite as chaotic. The Lapunov exponents don't add up to 2 pi t, but they are of the order of 2 times t, so about a factor of 1 over pi smaller. So they're not maximally chaotic, not quite like black holes, but they are very strongly chaotic. And you can associate that then with a the time constant uh, that just agrees with what I deduced before. Yes. Yes. So why are we still interested in the classical theory? Where is? Why are we interested? Because here we can do the calculation. Right. Your experiment said that one of the You're correct. And so you, ha you have to ask the question, how can you relate this to quantum physics? Also, G doesn't run at the classical field. G runs the quantum field. That's correct. Right. So the classical theory, there's no running. And, and so um, it only makes sense in, and, and also the comparison to, um, you know, the uh, ADSFT. Uh, duality only makes sense in a domain but where you are sufficiently far away from the natural scale of QC, where the running is, 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 is weak, is slow, right? But this is of course true in the experiments too. You want to start with initial temperature that is far above the temperature scale where the, the theory becomes pseudo -critical. So that running of the coupling is not a primary consideration. Yeah, so my problem then is you want the strongly coupled theory. You argue about the strongly coupled theory for the region where the coupling is weak. Right. <laughs> so there is the coupling constant, but the relevance here is the coupling constant times the number of colors. Right? And so the relevant constant uh, for that, that's of importance is alpha s or is more like g squared times the number of colors. And in the case of QCD, that's of the order of 10 or more. Right? So actually, the coupling include the, the top coupling is large, although the gauge coupling that goes into calculations is not very large. So again, this leads to a short thermalization time that's significantly shorter than one femtometer over C. In this context, quarks haven't, the influence of quarks hasn't been studied uh, numerically, but there's no reason to believe why they should destroy that picture. So how can you make context now with quantum effects? If you want to transport the consideration in classical physics into quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, you need to have the ability to uh, use a formalism that actually makes connection to the phase space distribution description in classical physics. And there's a natural way to do this in quantum mechanics, and that is the so-called Fushimi distribution, which is a Fourier transform of the density matrix. So um, if one writes down the Wigner function in quantum mechanics, which is um, a, uh, a Fourier transform of 
the density matrix of x and x prime, you Fourier transfer, you get a Wigner function of momentum and position. The Wigner function itself in quantum mechanics is not positive definitely. So you cannot use it, although it has an analogy to a density distribution, you cannot use it because to calculate an entropy because it's not positive definitely. But once you smear it with a Gaussian and you can use a minimal Gaussian of a width of h bar to incorporate the uncertainty relation, you generate a quantum mechanical analog of the classical phase space density, which is called the Husimi function. And that you can use to actually dis define an entropy, just like you do it in the case of classical physics by saying the entropy is given by the integral over the Husini density times the log. This was proposed by Miel in the mid 1970s. And one can show that the Husini entropy related to the Miel entropy actually grows just like the classical entropy, the entropy after coarse graining with the sum of the classical level of exponents. So there is an analog in the quantum theory of the growth of entropy that you obtain uh, in this particular way. I show here an example, which is a very simple example of the um, so it's very simplified version of the Mills theory with a typical interaction, fourth order interaction between uh, the, uh, the, the space, co the, the, the field coordinates, Q1 and Q2 correspond to some young Mills fields. And you can actually follow this now and can show how equilibrium, thermal equilibrium is obtained. And you, and this follows exactly this, the classical um, description that I showed you before. So phase space becomes distributed, uh, filled by evolution, just as it would be in a classical ensemble. So where are we? Okay, we have a few minutes left. So let me finally, so this is a way of looking at the same physics, but from a different point of view that before we studied in the context of the holography and the ABS CFT duality. So what does thermal equilibrium really mean in this context? And how can we maybe come back to black hole physics and heavy ions and make a connection? So in classical physics, in classical statistical physics, when you think of a thermal system and also in quantum mechanics, when you think of a statistical system, a thermal system, we have a system that's embedded in a heat bath. And it's thermal because the heat bath has a temperature and the exchange energy back and forth. And so you have a system that is an open system that's not in a pure state, but attains a, a statistical thermal ensemble. If you have, like in the case of a heavy ion collision where two nuclei collide, there is no heat path. To two nuclei collide, you produce a system that's really generated from a pure quantum state so in principle, you have a system that's also in a complicated but pure quantum state. So how do you make sense out of thermal equilibrium in this case? So fundamentally, the idea is that the system appears to be in thermal equilibrium, although in reality, it is in a pure quantum state. And uh, let me go over, skip the next few slides because we may not need them. Um, and, and come to a concept that's been very uh, much studied over the last few years, and that is the energy eigenstate hypothesis. The idea here is that if you have a system that is a chaotic system, and we have, as I argued, good reason to believe that QCD is a chaotic system, both at the classical and the quantum level, then such a system can exhibit thermal features, even if it's in a pure energy eigenstate that is not a density matrix, but a single pure state. And what this um, energy eigenstate uh, thermalization hypothesis says is that 
Um, if you look at an observable, a reasonably measurable, simple observable, let's call that A, then you can obtain the energy, the, the matrix elements between energy eigenstates of that observable and express them as in terms of the diagonal matrix elements and the off-diagonal matrix elements. The diagonal matrix elements are those of the expectation values. They are simple quantities. The off-diagonal elements encode the complex nature of the system and the energies eigenstates, and they really can be represented in terms of random matrices. But the random matrices have certain properties. Their size is suppressed by the entropy, the classical, the entropy of the thermal system. So in other words, the entropy associated with the energy that you're looking at. And so they have the value of e to the minus the entropy over two. If the entropy is large, these off diagonal elements are strongly suppressed. And in addition, there is a factor that depends on the energy difference between the two states, E alpha and E beta, that you take the matrix elements in between. So the off diagonal elements are statistically suppressed compared to the diagonal elements. And you can show that the diagonal elements are really what yields the thermal properties of the system. Um, in other words, the energy average um, of these diagonal elements is equal to the thermal average that you would get from a system that would not be an energy eigenstate, but a thermal state. And one can prove a number of different um, statements under these assumptions. So um, when you look at the system, the quantum system, in terms of the variable A, and you could choose different variables A as long as they are reasonably simple measurable quantities, um, then the system is ergodic, which means that the long time average of that observable is equal to the thermal value of that observable. You can further choose that the fluctuations around that average are tiny for a system of many degrees of freedom. The quantum fluctuations of the system are equal to the thermal fluctuations. So in other words, what you, for the system, when looked at in the observable A, when you observe the fluctuations, the quantum fluctuations really represent the thermal fluctuations of the system. And finally, you can even calculate correlation functions of the values of the observable at different times, and you find that they are given by a Kubo formula. So in other words, the system in an energy eigenstate behaves effectively like a thermal system, as long as you look at it from observables that have a certain experimental simplicity. In other words, that are not uh, observables that depend on very large numbers of degree, de degrees of freedom in a fine-tuned way. So, in other words, looking at the system through a simple observable makes a system in an energy eigenstate look like a thermal system. And there's a consensus that has been formed that whenever the system is chaotic, that holds. So that actually you have that ability to describe a system, although it is in principle in a quantum mechanical pure state in terms of a thermal average. Question. Yes. So you wrote the formula for the big elements of A, and one of the, one of the terms was the entropy. Mm -hmm. Now, the, that's going kind to of depend on the operator that A that chooses that, right? The entropy. Entropy should be a function only of the energy. Yes. So even though the operator A is on both sides, this entropy does not depend on your choice of operator. That's correct. What depends on A is what exactly the random matrix is and what the um, 
function f of e and omega is. Right? But the entropy is independent of the operator. So we've looked at QCD now from a different points of view. We've looked at it from um, the classical level, that is a chaotic system. Indeed, that's what one finds. We've looked at it from the point of view of gauge theories that have a gravity dual. And we found that indeed, we find the rapid approach to thermal equilibrium. We made the connection to a perturbation of the system through a sudden energy injection, uh, what one calls a quench in quantum physics typically that leads to thermalization. And um, in addition, there's also something that I didn't mention, but the experiments typically don't look at the complete final state. They look only at a fraction of the final state that can be detected as can see. And that also probably helps um, the interpretation in terms of a thermal state. So let me finally conclude with a few words about um, what's currently being studied and what is of interest beyond what I've talked about before. If the, the corpulent plasma that's formed, that thermalized under its own pressure expands and eventually breaks up into hadrons. And of course, what the experiments measure are the hadrons that come out. They don't actually measure the corpulent plasma. Well, they do measure it in some sense because they look sometimes at how probes like jets or electron positron pairs, but the most complete observations are done of the hadrons that are emitted when the corpulent plasma disassembles. And so from the point of view of what we've dealt with so far, the way of looking at that hadronization in a schematic way would be as follows. So initially we have the hot corpulent plasma that's generated from the nuclear collide. In principle, it's in approximately a pure quantum state, but because of the chaotic nature of quantum chromodynamics, it looks like a thermal state. Really what happens is, what really is going on is that the many quanta that make up the quark gluon plasma, the quarks and antiquarks and gluons are highly entangled in their internal state, but they form a system that obeys this energy thermalization hypothesis. Now, as it, it disassembles in the hadrons, it radiates hadrons. And it radiates these hadrons really in a thermal way. In other words, it has, it's a hot state and in practice, the hadrons that are emitted are emitted just like thermal radiation. Initially, of course, these hadrons are entangled in a quantum mechanical way with the interior of with the quarkron plasma from which they are emitted. But if you look only at the hadrons, they are basically random statistical system. As more and more hadrons are emitted, the hadrons become more and more entangled with each other and only partly with the remnant quarkron plasma because the quarkron plasma shrinks and its entropy shrinks. So more and more entanglement has to be among those hadrons. And eventually when the quarkron plasma is gone, then all the hadrons among these must be quantum mechanically entangled in a very complicated way, however, in a way that we don't know how to measure. It turns out that this is very similar to the case of a black hole. It's an analog here that's been studied over the last few years. In this case, the evaporation process is Hawking radiation. And when you look at this here, Hawking radiation proceeds not by emission of individual particles, but by particle hole, particle antiparticle pairs, where one particle at the event horizon is emitted to infinity. You see that's Hawking radiation. The other one is emitted into the black hole. And because they are created out of the vacuum, these two particles are quantum mechanically entangled, like Bell pairs in the famous Bell experiment. So they're quantum mechanically entangled pairs of particles. In this sense, the particle that's emitted is entangled with the black hole. What is peculiar in the case of the black hole, it is that it's really, apart from gravity, empty space. And so these quanta that are emitted internally propagate ballistically. You can follow them geometrically. And so the entanglement of the, uh, um, of, of, of the outgoing radiation 
is entangled it is with a specific geometric position inside the black hole. The old quanta that have been emitted initially correspond to quanta that are already deep inside the black hole. So in other words, the entanglement is between the outgoing radiation and the core of the black hole. And this is in, in, in the terminology of the community that describes this called the island, the core of the black hole. So you have a geometric disconnection between the radiation with the entangled part of the black hole. And one can use this to describe how, as a function of time, the radiation, the Hawking radiation is initially really thermal, truly thermal, no internal entanglement in first approximation, but as more and more and more is emitted, as it comes out of the black hole, there is more and more entanglement among the radiated particles. And in the end, everything is entangled. But the entanglement is not experimentally observable because it is between particles, photons that are emitted long times apart into different regions of space. In the quark gluon plasma, it's a little bit different because here the emission hadronization happens by particles, quarks, combination of quarks or antiquarks that are emitted from the surface of the plasma. And so there is no analog of a particle that goes into the quark gluon plasma. But in condensed matter physics, we're used, if you have takeaway particles from the system, we can interpret as a whole. But of course, the difference here is that there is no quasi-particle hole state in a quark gluon plasma because it's really not empty free space, it is a hot system. And so any hole state corresponding to a meson or a baryon hole in the plasma will immediately fall apart. And there will be a much more complicated process. So how can, can you describe that in a similar way? Certainly there is no simple geometric description just like in the case of a black hole. However, there's an idea here. And the idea is that if we can make use of the dual holographic description, then the evaporation process that in the four-dimensional space-time becomes extremely complicated, can be back again mapped onto a black hole evaporation process. And so the idea would be to try to do a similar calculation, but now in the dual picture that shows how the entanglement among the emitted hadrons comes about and can be described in this five-dimensional way in a simple geometric fashion and allows us to understand how the entropy of the emitted hadrons is uh, at coarse graining grows up to the total entropy. But if you really could do the quantum mechanical analysis, you would find that eventually it would be zero because all the hadrons would together form a perfect pure state that corresponds to the pure state of the two colliding nuclei. And this will only be possible um, in a dual holographic picture. And that's something that Joseph Lapp has begun to work on a few weeks ago. It looks quite promising. So um, just a summary and outlook. Um, I talked about uh, the thermalization and the hadronization of the quark gluon plasma. And that's what we're interested in. It has direct connections to the black hole information paradox, as I explained, but it also has a lot of connections to quantum computing, where in a similar way, one tries to understand how it is possible to uh, recover the lost information in the decoherence of qubits by looking at uh, the surrounding qubits that allow for error, um, uh, for error correction. A final quick comment, the next frontier, I think, will be to apply this not to thermal systems, but to systems that are interesting because they're also complex quantum system, and we don't really understand how they work. And then in particular will be protons and neutrons. Um, here we have systems that we know that when looked at at high energy contain many, many quanta. They're strongly coupled through the quantum QCD interactions. 
And apart from the valence quarks, you can also think of them as states with vacuum quantum numbers. So there are many other particles that are together acting like a vacuum, highly excited at high energy, but not thermal. And the question is how we can understand how they are put together um, and how looking at such a system at different scales can be again understood in the concept of entanglement and the evolution uh, of entanglement, what one calls entanglement re renormalization at different scales. This is being studied right now in ultra peripheral collisions at the RIC and the LHC, where one can use photons from the electromagnetic field carried by a lead or a gold nucleus hitting a gold or a lead, another gold nucleus. But in the future, it will be studied in much more detail at the electron ion collider, where we can finally probe the complicated entanglement structure of a multiparticle system like the proton or the neutron in all detail. This, I think, will be an interesting uh, question for the future. Um, and I'll stop here and ask your questions. We've got a little over time, but does somebody have a, a pressing question they want to ask before we have everybody go? Oh, we have some. Yaron. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ben, for the very nice talk. I enjoyed it very much. I want to ask you about the ETH when you replace a complex quantum system, which is chaotic, by a thermal ensemble. There should be a way to estimate the temperature of the ensemble, which depends probably on the interactions and so on. When you apply it to the quadron plasma and you measure the hadrons and you have the temperature, can you, can you make this relation between the quantum complicated state and the, temp and the, and the temperature of the thermal state? Yeah, so usually um, you look at the system as a single quantum system. And so you have a, a total energy and the temperature associated with that. In this particular case, because we're looking at quantum field theory, it's really that you have an energy density. Um, and, and so the temperature, of course, is an um, intensive quantity describes the energy density. And so you have to relate it to the energy density of the system rather than its total energy. Is that answering your question? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, but. Yeah, so basically you connect the energy density to the temperature in the usual way we do it in thermodynamics. So. Correct. Right. right. Yes. Yeah, so I have that's, that's a good answer. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's thank Bernd again. Um, he's willing to be around. And as I said, he's over in the West Wing in Wright Lab if you want to ask questions, sort of, you know, where the type is here on sabbatical. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.